And uh, thanks to everybody who's contacted me out there, and, and everybody's been really nice, and, and it's just been great to to be with you all on Red Ice. Wonderful. Thanks, uh, Court. I'm really looking forward to diving into some of this new material here today with you. Um, maybe we can do a quick little recap, though, of some of the things that we talked about. Uh, one thing that I was interested in, again, in kind of, uh, I guess, clearing out an issue is in regards to how you how you draw up the lines, how you make uh, uh, a connection, so to speak, let's say between two cities or something like that. Uh, we talked last time about that you're primarily using Google Earth and so forth. Uh, do you do like a page dump and draw lines with it, or do you use some kind of tool in order to link up uh, one city to another one, or how do you how do you approach this? Yeah, you can use the measuring tool that's included there with Google Earth that gives you a distance and bearing. Um, of anything. They're, they have another tool that's a line tool that you can do that will just give you a distance along any angle you want to go. So the, the, the bearing tool and um, distance tool gives you the, the, the shortest distance in bearing or any angle that you want to measure with it too. So you, if you're using like a, an element of a monument that may point somewhere, you kind of figure out what which bearing it's pointing to. And this is all with, with the latitude and longitude grid as north. And, um, and do you also... Then, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go, well, then I just pull the line out and see what's along it. And then and you, you, I just survey it using Google Earth, zooming in on things, using the, the information that they have available and all the, the, the cities and geographic information they include. So, and do, do, uh, do that, when you do that, does that include like the curvature of the Earth as well? Or is this like if you would have laid the map out flat and, and draw a line between it? Do you know how that works? Yes, yes, I do. And the tool that actually does that for you. Oh. That you're pulling, it's it's like giving you a compass bearing from the point you're measuring from. I see, I see. And um, yeah. last time, of course, we were primarily focusing in on uh, Thomas Jefferson's uh, uh, line, so to speak, his township grid, and so forth. But since then, you've you've pretty much uh, gone into this whole other area in regards to uh, the potential roots of this. I guess. Uh, we, I guess we can begin talk a little bit about. Where you think this stems from to begin with, you you discover something in regards to the Egyptians that they developed latitude and longitude. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Now this is my theory. I'm just supposing this. No one else is, you know. I think other people have kind of suggested that they thought this must exist because the pyramids are oriented to true north. And um, let me speak again to the to the measuring tool in Google Earth because that's going to come into the story here too. The the angles that that's given you are measured with regard to latitude and longitude, so grid north and true north are very close. So so you know they're pretty much inter interchangeable for our purposes here, just to generally describe ley lines and things like that. But what I noticed was with the, with that what started me thinking that the Egyptians may have had a form of latitude and longitude is the fact that I had vectored the northeast uh, facet of the pyramid, that angle out, and it seemed to intersect with the ruins at Baalbek. I mean, I could even stretch that and say that it matches the facet of the hexagon in the ruins of Baalbek, it seems to at about 45.55 degrees. Hmm. Uh, you know, you can move these things around a little bit and make it do what you want to do. I just noticed that it matched, and it matches the angle really, really close to the way that structure is built, too. Huh. And others have supposed that these two structures are, are, are related. Uh, Sitchin, for instance, he, he is... is uh, um, a linguist that has done a lot of work that we all, you, know, you may have heard of him before. Sure, yeah. Uh, in Samaria, and he supposes that the pyramids in Baalbek and Mount Ararat form a line by which the Anuaki had a landing site, you know. So so he, he noticed this connection. Others like Graham Hancock and, and uh, 
Boval noted the 45 degree angle orientation of the pyramids themselves, and this all fits into this. Hmm. People, other people are noticing this angular association too, and really, it is a, a very close to being a perfect 45 degree angle. And that just speaks to how well the pyramids are laid out right there. It speaks to the mystery of how did the Egyptians know they oriented their their structures towards the pole that's in the middle of the ocean. How did they know this? It's a basic mystery that people have supposed before. Yes. So I, I started looking at this relationship, and I noticed that the distance between the two also was about 407 miles by my measurement on Google Earth. Mm. And, and this scene, do, go do you, ahead. Do you think that uh, Baalbek is the first site where everything stems from or do you think that the the, the pyramids in uh, in Egypt is the origin of this what do you think well I think the pyramids were there first is the what most people believe and that's kind of where I'm proceeding from but it's possible that the, the things you read about Baalbek too also do suggest that there could have been several temples there prior to the remains that are there now that may or may not have involved the, the large trilithon stones that are there that are a mystery also how those were moved there because mm -hmm. those are um, could be the largest cut stones in the world the largest man-made stones ever made and uh, so I mean I'm not claiming to notice this relationship of the two places I just noticed it from pulling the lines on Google Earth it's very interesting though <laughs> You know? So, yeah, the association just seems such a coincidence. When I first found it, I was just like, there's no way. Yeah. You know, I couldn't I couldn't believe it. And, and everybody there at home, too, if you're listening, go to Google Earth and give this a try. Just just put the line tool there on the, the southwest corner of the Great Pyramid. And uh, even if the image they have up there doesn't show you where the pyramid would be from plan view, just connect the two corners and you can usually get a pretty fair you know, angle from that, or just go that 45.55, and, and if you pull it to Lebanon, to Baalbek, it, you'll see that if you match it to the facet of the hexagon, it'll match it, hmm. at, at within 45 degree to 46 degrees. Do, do, you, um, do you think that this could be made by uh, surveying on from the Earth, or on the Earth, or, or does this imply that you have, they ha had to have some kind of uh, uh, aerial perspective in order to get this, or can, do you think you can do it from from Earth by measuring correctly? Yes, it could be done from Earth. It, I think we'd all would love to, you know, think that that the Sumerians came in with the spacecraft and did it and everything like that. But it is entirely possible to have they, they could have gone overland and, and surveyed that way if they had skills at that. I mean, there's no evidence that they even had a compass but but the fact that they're orienting their buildings the way they did suggests that they did hmm. so they could have, have surveyed over land 90 degrees to a point where they were 90 degrees south of Baalbek and then surveyed their where, way to there but it's incredibly accurate that the angle matches the 45 degree angle and the, it's about 407 miles so so when I examine this spatial relationship i just started thinking in terms of a hypotenuse and what is that for people who don't know and that is the diagonal measurement of a, a square or a rectangle mm. from, from which you know you obviously you, that's a model for the square or rectangle itself you can draw a square or rectangle just from a diagonal line by just you know connecting the square angles around the the ends of the line mm-hmm mm -hmm. So I started looking at that, and I realized that it seemed to match a uh, four degree north south by five degree east to west block of longitude block of lat long that we use today on maps. Or it was very close. I'm not claiming that it was. It perfectly matches what we have today, but it, it it's close enough that it's possible that that this is what they were using it for. Hmm. The angle certainly matches it. The location of the pyramid is neither on a perfect line of latitude or longitude, but it's very close to being even in both, and so is Baalbek. 
And my thoughts with this distortion was, well, if they had surveyed over land or, or marked it in by some terrestrial means that there could be a little bit of error <laughs> involved. But it, it, it also got me thinking that the purpose of the whole thing was to orient everything with the pyramids, yeah. whether they knew where true north or south was or not. My, my, my thought was, well, possibly they valued making everything square with the pyramids, and it wasn't to true north. And, and I, I just had another wild thought, too, that at the time that maybe the pyramids were built using a compass at a point when true north matched magnetic north yes because, because that's that's changing a little bit all the time i guess and and uh, uh magnetic north is is very difficult to pinpoint but what you're talking about is that um at at a time when um they built the pyramids or at least aligned it they they, they did so towards uh, what at that point was true north right Exactly, or that's what we consider that today. Mm. But if at the time they built the structures, the magnetic pole was at that point that we define as true north today, which I think is within the realm of possibility. If you look at the globe and the way and the charts of the way the poles wander, you can see that it could match. Mm. So I mean, it's a slim possibility. But my thought was, well, then we had the, this this cultural affectation or subsequent cultures to the Egyptians and the Egyptians and the self-valued squaring things with the pyramids, not even thinking that it was true north or having to find that to themselves because possibly this was magnetic north to them anyway. Yeah. So that, that, that's possible, but it's just a thought and I throw things out there sometimes that, you know, that, that just gets you thinking and it, I'm not saying all this is absolutely true, but, some of it can be inferred from what you look at on the map. Well, absolutely. And what you've done is that you've drawn up these lines in Google Earth. And as you said, anyone can do it for themselves. And but how how much would you say it potentially differs? Is that something that you can tell in Google Earth as well? Let's say that you draw up a line and can you tell if it's um, a few you know feet off or, 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 or a couple of hundred feet? Or, or how much are we talking about approximately here? Is, maybe that's difficult to say. Well, I mean, the the... the the little uh, guides they give you on there go to zero, but I mean, I'm sure there, there's some, it, it must be, I know in, in, even with accurate GPS equipment, sometimes it's hard to get sub-meter accuracy. I'm sure the, the imagery that we're getting with Google Earth, Earth has some amount of distortion. Mm. Uh, with regard to the, to the pyramids in Baalbek, though, even on Google Earth, there's a way you can check different imagery right there on Google Earth. If you go into the, the, the view, there's a history tab you can click on. And it and, uh, brings up a slider with different dates of images that are view, uh, available of what you're looking at at that time. Yeah. So you can even find a better shot of the pyramids that is more from plan view if you want to sketch out the lines I'm talking about and see for yourself how close they are and and um, and have a look at it. I mean, Google Earth's just fun to get on there. And, and uh, gee whiz, if nothing else, I hope from everybody listening to me, they go on there and just, just mess around with it and learn something there. Yeah, absolutely. Play around with it. And again, if we look at the Baalbek, you have obviously a uh, awful lot of good pictures on your blog, uh, Survival Cell. Uh, dot blogspot.com where people can scroll down on any post and look, and look at some of these pictures and one of them is of course uh, over the hexagon of Baalbek that we talked about and basically we have six lines drawn out from that and we talked about one of these lines uh, connect them with the, with the Great uh, Pyramid but tell us about some of the other lines uh, you have drawn them up in different colors obviously which makes it more uh, easier but there are definitely interesting uh, connection in regards to some of the cities uh, that come up in relation to some of these lines. Tell, tell us tell us about that, Court. It is. I mean, there's just something about this structure that's always been valued. We know, you know, Kaiser Wilhelm, uh, back in the pre-World War I days, valued it. There's a plaque there. Uh, there's even uh, um, some references I've read to them using Baalbek as the center of a map projection which is a datum to draw a map from, you mm. know, on the world. All right. So, you know, so um, so there's always value through history of this place, and I just started looking at it in the terms that I was looking at some of the structures over here in, in the States 
with about how they can point lines to places. So I started vectoring out the the directions that the um, the facets of the hexagon pointed. Yes. And again, these points you're measuring are like compass points, as if you were standing right there. You know, if you go, if you pull it, you know, a hundred miles away and try to pull the same compass bearing, it's going to take you a different direction than you were going from before. So you have to pull from your from your datum spot. Mm. So I pulled all those out and measured them, and there is a picture there on the blog of it, and they all seem to go to in the vicinity of some historically interesting places, and 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 of course the pyramids are there. And if that line continues to the northeast, we have Mount Ararat up there in Turkey. Mm-hmm. Yep. That 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 is, there, there's two. Um, there there's a big peak of Mount Ararat, and then a smaller volcano near it, and the line seems to go right between the two there. And I think uh, Mount yeah. Ararat was one of these places where, well, for for a while at least, they, they uh, consider this to be the the spot where Noah's Ark uh, pretty much landed. I guess we can say. Yeah, that it has all kinds of significance in, in in the Bible and Gnostic studies, and and also this region of Turkey near Lake Van. There is also some references I've read to to uh, uh, Jewish tribes being from that region, and and are occupying that region and other cultures too. That you know that are of interest, and and that whole area up there is volcanic, and Lake Fan is interesting too. It's a it's a great salt lake too, mm-hmm. and it's just a, just an interesting. Nimrudog is up there, which is a very interesting site also. That's not on the line; it's near it, but but that's a just a lot of interesting things on that vector. And then if that line, if you stretch it all the way up to Kazakhstan, it's it it's near the city of Astana. Mm-hmm. Which you know, um, Tex Mars has pointed out. He he's researches occult monuments also. That they're building this vast array of of new geomantic structures there, including pyramids and and all kinds of interesting towers. They they have this really really interesting uh, stadium there that looks like a UFO with a big see through top to it that's a big tower with a light on it you you all have to go online or there's some pictures of that in the video one of the videos i have on youtube also interesting what was the so name and uh, what's the name again of, of the city or area it, it it's called uh, astana a-s-t-a-n-a and it's in kazakhstan astana interesting and uh do you know if this was one of the places where there i think there was somewhere in uh Russia, one of the the former states of of the Soviet Union, where they were bu- building a big uh, glass type pyramid structure. Do you know if that's the one, or if if, if this is another one that you're ta- referring it, to? It could be the one that you're thinking about too. The man, the gentleman who built the pyramid that's in Astana, has also built, I think, a few other ones in the former Soviet you know republics also. Mm. But he did build the one that's in the array there, too. And the man who designed it is an English architect. And I don't have his name right in front of me right now. But it, it, it seemed, from from what uh, Tex Mars is writing about that place, it's a Masonic city. There's a lot of orientation towards that there. There's a lot of energy resources in the region up there. And this just whole new city is being built of, of towers. And, and they have a whole plaza that that's very modern looking and space age uh, geomantic array compared to a lot of the older things you see, uh, you know, on the earth. So it's it's kind of interesting to look at. There's lots of articles online about that, and I I do briefly mention it in one of the videos that I have on YouTube. It's uh, f- for those who are listening here. It's actually uh, Norman Foster who who built this uh, the pyramid, and he's of course a f- famous uh, architect, which done a lot of work in in London as well. But they call this place. Uh, I think that you're referring to uh, Palace of Peace and Reconciliation, or Pyramid of Peace, actually. And they have this really that's interesting... It, yeah. That's it, right? Yeah. And they have this di- very, very interesting picture of it as well, where the Pyramid of Peace is lit up in different colors. Really, really interesting. Different lights, red, yellow, blue, and green. So people can check out that. I'm going to add a link uh, to that so people can take a look at it. Very interesting. Yeah, it is just fascinating that they're... they're they're really just building this from the ground up, and it's all venerations of older structures. And I'm, I'm sure they're all built with sacred geometry and all the the mantic array and everything. So it's kind of interesting to see what they're doing with that. Absolutely. 
Um, then you have another uh, line that goes, if we talk about the, the green uh, line from, from Baalbek, the hexagon, which actually seems to uh, cross over Carthage, which again is an Im- important site if we think about the Council of Carthage, actually, where some of the, uh, it's like a second council after a council of Nicaea, I guess, when they did some kind of uh, 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 refinement, so to speak, of, uh, of the biblical uh, text, pretty much. Well, there's the, there's that, and then there's just the 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 succession in in the cultures, the way they've moved around, you know, from Phoenicia to Carthage, and the Roman aspects of Carthage too. It's even the the line coming from from Baalbek is kind of symbolic or talismanic because that some some um, anthropologists and archaeologists believe the culture went from. Uh, Phoenicia to Carthage and then possibly to Rome. Mm. Uh, that uh, the culture that may contain this group of people that were kind of in search of here that do the geomancy and and really value these structures beyond what the public does. Mm. So so that is a very interesting line. I mean, there's so much history in Carthage, and that if you even look today on Google Earth and look at Carthage, you can see the remains of the War Harbor. Uh-huh. Mm. And it, it's around uh, that they dug it into the, the waterfront there, and they used to have an array of uh, um, temples and structures there too. And, and it's just it's really unique and interesting to look at that. If you all get a chance there, look at Carthage on Google Earth. And that, so that's one of the successions of cultures. Why it's interesting that the line goes there. So it's almost like that potentially here. Just uh, a thought I got is that they potentially are building. Um, Th- this is like a uh, starting point for civilization, pretty much, this hexagonal shape in Baalbek. And then they've built uh, different structures, monuments, and cities according to, if you vector these lines out uh, at different times. And, and Astana that we talked about might, ju- might just be the, the latest uh, version of this, so to speak, right? Uh, yes, that's true. Or it, 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 Today it may have evolved into a sect of people who just value having it having their new buildings associated with that yes because there if there's one if you follow the northwest trending fact uh, facet of the great pyramid the line seems to go right near the pyramid in memphis tennessee oh really yeah if you follow that that line at the angle that it it starts at it's another 45 degree angle it's 315 degrees and if you pull it all the way to memphis tennessee it's I think within about a mile of the pyramid-shaped arena in Memphis. Hmm, how about that? It doesn't go right to it or anything. I, I couldn't make it do that. <laughs> <laughs> but it seems to me, I mean, this man, there. That, that here we go back to Tex Mars again. He's discussed the gentleman who, who built that arena as the owner of the Hard Rock, Rock Cafe uh, franchise. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and there's rumors, that they, I mean, some of the things you read on the Internet, and stuff that he actually spent the night in the Great Pyramid and had a, a an experience while he was there and was told to build this pyramid in to, in Memphis. Oh, really? How about that? That's the what this. I think that's what he tells people why he built the pyramid. And it's a civic arena where they have sporting events and concerts and things right. like that. Huh. And how about uh, there's another one in Sacramento, right? Which also connects. Is that with the Great Pyramid or is that with the uh, the the Baba Hexagon? That seems to. I mean, the, from the imagery that's on Google Earth, if you go to Teotihuacan in Mexico, near Mexico City, to the Pyramid of the Sun, mm-hmm. and uh, the, it's the northwest trending facet of that pyramid. Mm. If you trace a line at that angle from that point, it ends up in Sacramento. Sacramento. Okay, so it's so between Teotihuacan and Sacramento that, that that's connection is. Yeah, I can't remember the angle right off again right now, mm-hmm. but um, that it takes you right to the building. It seems to interesting. So, you know, there, there's there, it is interesting. I, it, if if as I say, if you're if you're using that angle anywhere along that point, closer or farther away, it won't work. But from the from the datum point, it works. Hmm. So all these so, yeah. pyramids are having are have relationships with each other in relation to how they build them and how they line up, which is very interesting because, again, it seems to be 
that at least the architects, those who drop these plans, have a <laughs> conscious idea that they want they want it in some way to connect with another pyramid structure on the Earth. Uh, yeah, there's one in Turkey also. Okay. Mm -hmm. it's, di it's directly north of the Great Pyramid. In Antalya, Turkey, there's a, a plaza and pyramid there that seems to be aligned with, with the, the Great Pyramid at, at a north-south relationship. Mm. So, yeah, there, there, there seems to be a modern value of people, whether it's just, hey, this is cool, let's do it, or to me, it, it seems to go beyond that. But uh, that. There's a trend, yeah. It seems to be that people value these vectors even today. Yes. Um, so, so do you think that that's um, that's done for again uh, geomantic uh, uh, purposes? That that this is in some way creating a an uh, an energetically charged, if you will, uh, grid pattern across the Earth? Or, or uh, have you thought about this of why they're doing it? Yes. Yeah. Well, I think if nothing else, it's symbolic. Yeah. It, it, it's just saying, look, we, we we did this or we're part of this or we caused this. This is part of your heritage, you know, or, or this is part. You are part of our heritage. It's just symbolic, if nothing else, if there are no real functions of, of these monuments and arrays and everything like that. If nothing else, it's to serve in the mind of people what's going on. And then we've all read a lot about how the um Occult symbolism has many different meanings, and they all, uh, many of the monuments record sacred geometry and really practical things, as well as the hidden meanings. Yes. And what they mean to Gnostic groups or whatever, they still mean things to the public beyond that, obviously. So, it's, you know, That's right. I, I think it's symbolic, and, and there are there is a group of people that believes that they do things. Yeah. We we can't forget that. I mean, there there it's possible. I, mean, I don't discount. Uh, I can't prove that they can't, just as well as many of them <laughs> can't prove that they can do something. But <laughs> it, it, that that belief is there, and he, uh, even if it's true or not, the fact that people believe it and behave as if things really happen is an important factor. Absolutely, that's I mean, that's. What I mean, we're let's take the out. other direction towards Mecca. There's one that. One of the vectors does go to Mecca, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and when I, you know, I looked at that. Obviously, this the religion originally worshipped at Baalbek, the, the Sumerian, you know, worshiping of the tree or the tree of life. The, the all the images we see of this in Sumerian art and and Babylonian art that that Islam rejects. You know, this is part of the things that they say in their doctrine. We, we rejected worshiping the tree and everything. So that maybe them placing Mecca or choosing Mecca as a, their place of to be the holy city is, is a symbolic rejection of that. Yeah, because that was so like uh, Mecca was one of the, the later uh, cities. I think the, the, the main headquarters for were uh, Islam kind of sprang up was uh, Medina, if I'm not mistaken, and and they later on moved it to to Mecca. So that could have been done, so to speak, by the more uh, those in the more um, occult in the know uh, in yeah, the know, the, so to speak. The, yeah, exactly. Exactly, it does exist in the Islamic world. It's it's easy to look at any mosque with the minarets and domed structures and everything and tell that they have a value of it. Yeah. It, that that I'm just starting to delve into that. That's one 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 of the other aspects I'm going to get to in the next volume of uh, geomantic information systems is looking at some th uh, some of the Eastern cultures a little bit more. And, I uh, mean, I got interested in Thomas Jefferson and it's kind of consumed me here <laughs> this time. So <laughs> yes, uh, and what we also can mention, I guess, is that uh, in relation to to Mecca and, and particularly the the Kaaba in Mecca is that. Uh, some of the stories at least tell that this the stone that they have inside of the Kaaba is this um, uh, black stone which allegedly fell from uh, from the sky or or the heaven. There's some kind of extraterrestrial uh, connection, so to speak, with that stone that they that they've uh, that they have stored or lodged inside the Kaaba. So that's also an interesting side note to all of this. Yeah, yeah. There's those that suppose it's a meteorite or does have some some quality, and that's why Muslims venerate it. Also, it's association with, with their, their beliefs and everything else, obviously, but maybe it is possible that it 
it does something. It's part of their their beliefs to to make the Hajj or pilgrimage there. Yeah, and uh, that's a big event in in the life of a Muslim to make the Hajj. Absolutely. So, so you're right. They're all there, drawn there in a way. Whether whether it's it's for you know philosophical reasons or some actual reason would be interesting to see. Absolutely. And uh, if we continue on that uh, the green line that we talked about, which goes through uh, Carthage, Carthage, we have. If we follow that line, we come up to uh, the Straits of Gibraltar, correct? Yeah, and, th- and th- this is just practical directional tool here, possibly that it, it says, "Look, here's the way out of the Mediterranean." <laughs> you know, I mean that that's another thing that we can't forget. It just points directions to go to places, and all this too is supposing, all, obviously, that that people in this age had a compass. A lot of people don't believe that this is true or not, but it seems from some of the spatial relationships we're seeing that they had to have something yeah. to, to to help them lay all this out. I mean, it, it's also, let, let me note while we're talking, it's just what, what kind of spurred my imagination in all of this with concerning Baalbek is also it, its orientation almost exactly on the 34th parallel. Yes. You know, it's like 34 degrees zero minutes and I think 20 some odd seconds which is just I'm like wow here's just one of the most interesting oldest uh, structures in the world and um, it sits on a an even line of a grid that we use in the modern world yeah so that just seemed curious and it got me thinking about all this and I think it is possible that they they use this as a design, as a as a latitude and longitude grid of some type, and and beyond that too. My my another thing that spurred my imagination was the hexagonal shape. Yes, and, and after, you know, along the line from the pyramid to the hexagonal shape there at Baalbek, I noticed that approximately every 100 miles equaled an even line of latitude. Hmm. That's how I started to think. Oh, this is a model for know latitude and longitude because it's just such an even distribution of you know where each line of latitude was yeah and also each structure is close to being at an even line of longitude they're, they're neither one of them is exact but as i say if they were measuring overland somehow at 90 degree angles or 45 degree angles which the egyptians may have valued also uh there might have been some some distortion but the, the angular association of the two places is just just uh, really fascinating. What role do you think uh, um, astronomy and even astrology play into this, uh, the idea that cities um, have alignments in accordance to uh, astronomical um, um, uh, posi- um, places in the sky or, or stars or uh, uh, a, a kind of an, an alignment grid that exists up in the sky in some way has been mirrored down on Earth. Everyone knows, of course, about the most famous one about uh, the Belt of Orion and the, and the the pyramids and so forth in in Egypt. But there is there is uh, other um, research that seems to point that other cities are aligned to uh, to stars and and uh, astronomical aligned grids. What do you think, Court? I think it's entirely possible and probable. One of my thoughts when I first started to to look into the uh, Thomas Jefferson and how he um, had a hand in developing the township grid and, and the reasons for it, uh, a thought crossed my mind that he was ar- arraying cities as in some pattern that was astrologically significant. Hmm. I don't know enough about that to look into it and find out, but I'm working on getting that information and it would be really interesting because it also just supports again that the the occult concept of as above so below that we we see repeated so much in a lot of occult readings and and people referring to that so in mapping that concept is really you know possible to display in things you're doing on a map or a a grid if you if you know about it so as above, so below can take on different meanings when you're thinking about it in that in those terms. Absolutely, I think uh, uh, I, w- I want to get into the the Romans a little bit here later. I want to 
in, in our next hour, talk a little bit more about uh, the Vatican primarily and, and Rome's connection to all of this as well. There's a few other lines that you've discovered in relationship to that. But one thing I can read is uh, basically uh, some research that was done by, um, let's see here, I don't have his name now, but it was done by someone at Cornell University in uh, in New York, Ithaca, that have studied ancient Roman towns pretty much and uh, by mm-hmm. using using astronomically aligned grids. Uh, and he came pretty much to the conclusion, I have this uh, this article up on on redasscreations.com and I'm going to link up that so people can read more about that for themselves. But he also, he came to that conclusion that uh, pretty much all of the Roman ancient cities in some way had alignments to uh, to star patterns. So it's, it's, it's right there. You know, it's very, very interesting. Um, sure. And that speaks to like, how did they, if they, if they had a goal to do that, how did they go about obtaining it even within some tolerance of, of degree of error? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> they exactly. had to have had some knowledge of it and possibly it was a knowledge of reading the stars. Um, because one idea that comes up, of course, is that, um, you, you know, we, there have been knowledge about this uh, for a long time uh, f- coming from the ancient world, but during specifically during uh, the Middle Ages, so to speak, and when, when a lot of uh, Western Europe and so forth was controlled under, under the Vatican, a lot of this knowledge was suppressed, which implies to us that no, no one before this could have known anything about it. But again, it just implies that uh, those who built uh, cities in, in and around Italy and Rome before that had this knowledge, and it was later removed in some way from um, from from when we got a more Catholic rule, uh, do you think that's a possibility? I think that's a possibility, and I still think, really, it, it, I can only speak to what the United States is like today. But that's still a very controlled thing, just property. You know, I mean, to to ninety nine point nine percent of us listening to this, probably just how to divide it up, if it how how to do it, who's doing it. It's a controlled secret, and that always has been privileged information. Yes. How to navigate on the earth. And, and that that's why I, I think in terms of, oh, maybe the Egyptians did know these orientations and measurements, and the Romans and Phoenicians subsequently also, because you just see evidence of it in the way the cities are laid out and things like that. Well, that's a I good... I mean, it even... Go yeah. ahead. Oh, no, I just want to say this. I think that's a good point, actually, to... to uh, to take into this, uh, this, these theories that we're talking about, that by potentially going to one of these monuments, you can get, uh, if you have the, the inner knowledge, so to speak, the secret knowledge of how to uh, get to other places on Earth or important towns or cities or, or sites, you can study, for instance, the hexagon then at Baalbek and know that, okay, if I follow this line, uh, vector this line, I can go to Carthage. If I follow this line, I can go, uh, you know, to the Great uh, Pyramid, pretty much, and, and you can figure way out is a way of navigating on the earth much as they do on the on the oceans right exactly well well what i began to do also was with with Baalbek as i i drew each facet a line from each facet out to 200 miles in length and i made a template and i started thinking of that in terms of the the old roman terms of how these things were established and and basically they had a geomancer yeah they had an auger that would come establish to the gnomon or center point of the templum. I mean, there you even have that word. Cartographers today use templates. Yeah, that's right. You yeah. know, there's that small connection, too. So I started to see Baalbek like it, as a form of, a, of this hexagonal template you could make. Mm. And I saw the, how the along the relationship between the pyramids and, and the ruins at Baalbek, the La, even latitude at every approximate 100 mile distance along that angle. So I took the template and set it up over Athens, mm-hmm. just uh, oriented towards magnetic north, just as how it seems to be at Baalbek. And the associations worked again. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So if you went along the 45 degree angle, the same, you know, divisions could be used. Now, You might say to yourself, well, 100 miles is a long way. How can they do that? The fact is, if they knew that those relationships, they can use that whole logic on a smaller scale, too. It's scalable, right? So you can do it in any in any scale. Yeah. Yeah. But this all depends on having a compass. So Mm -hmm. there's that 
that argument somebody else could make, well, we don't know that they even had that. So there, there is that problem <laughs> yes, yes. in the whole thing. I believe they did, though. It I seems do obvious yeah. that there's, there's something going on where they and, – and, and you, were t- you touched on this. It, that, that may have been a hidden or seemed to be magic to people who weren't aware of it. Sure, of course. Or they didn't know what it was. I mean, we have to think in terms of the age we're at where, I mean, th- th- this is where the tradition of knowledge being associated with the occult and... And, and, and power, right? It, knowledge yeah, is power. this is where it all comes from, exactly. And all this exclusive culture that developed around this to manipulate it and make it benefit them only. Yeah. So that's and, one of the things I know we're concerned with that that's motivated me in my writing a little bit. Yeah, I'm trying to be objective, but I keep seeing this pattern of of manipulation and secrecy of, of things that could be for the public good, but apparently weren't. I mean, we're we're talking the Egyptians here may have known this grid. Yeah, yeah. Now, now there's no really recorded knowledge of one existing from what I've read. You know, if somebody out there knows anything about more about this, let me know. But um, it's the Greeks later seem to be the first ones credited with 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 having this grid or, or, or using it in this fashion. Right, right, uh, and that's the official story, of course. But I think, as you say, yeah. Court, it goes back way way further back than that, you know. And well, there's you've even... got the pyramids, Baalbek, and you know the location of Istanbul today is near a really even line, Athens, mm. you know. So there, there's a lot of old cities that, that are on even lines of latitude and longitude. That's right. Could be a coincidence, but it does seem like there's something at work. Well, I think so, absolutely. I mean, um, I agree. another line that you've drawn up is, for instance, between uh, the Great Pyramid and uh, is that uh, the Pisa Tower, Tower of Pisa? Yeah, that, that again, that's the same line that goes to the Pyramid in Memphis, Tennessee, or near near that, and it goes near Pisa. It doesn't mm-hmm. go right over the Tower of Pisa, but it seems to go over the city mm-hmm. and through the Tuscany region, you know, where, where all the literary things. I can't remember the city right off my, where they have the polio right off the top of my head. Mm-hmm. But, um, are, are you talking U.S. Just, US now, or where, where are you? No, in, Itali- in, in Italy. In Italy, okay. Uh, hmm. um, I can't remember I that. I can't though. remember. It's not, that's just a minor point, but it's just a yeah. very colorful region of, of Italy. And it also, it's funny, there is a photo on, on um, Google Earth of Dragonara Castle. Mm-hmm, all right. Italy, and the line seems to go right uh, over that, and I just thought that was kind of intriguing. <laughs> <laughs> little side note there. Uh, Dragonara's Castle, is that the one? Yeah, Dragonara Castle, so uh, the dragon reference is right there. And, that's interesting. Yeah. Well, that, the, it could be a reference to the, the, the dragon, what is known as the dragon line or something like that. I don't know if it's um, if the dragon line is something somewhere else, but I know that one of these lines as well no, those are known they're all are yeah you can you yeah. can really use that term for any of them okay okay the dragon lines all right hmm, interesting yeah um how about the eiffel tower uh stonehenge uh connection with the great pyramid as well or, or are they just close well to the it, there could be one that that could be extrapolated i did notice that you know if you're if you're viewing on google earth again the nile delta obviously it looks like a delta or inverted triangle mm. it's so green, green it sticks out from the the desert colors there and i noticed the distribution of the city of alexandria and port syed seem kind of equidistant from the great pyramid so on a whim i, I vectored out lines from those and they were both about 111 miles from the tip of the great pyramid mm. so both cities at least points within them you can find that I used the old location of the lighthouse in Alexandria Okay. Mm. for the way I vectored that line. And then I just pulled it out to see where it went. And it, it you know, it went all through the classical parts of Greece where I'm sure you, you can't just drop a coin somewhere and find another old one or some <laughs> the archaeological site of some kind. Right, right. But it did go to Stonehenge mm. along that line and that angle. Mm-hmm. And it, it pretty much went right to it, you know. At that scale, when you get down to it and start moving the line, a lot, you know, a quarter of a mile either side of Stonehenge, it barely moves the gauge of the angle <laughs> that <laughs> you're pulling. So, 
you know, so you, you, you can use your imagination a little bit, but it's good. it went very close to that. How much have you looked at uh, Britain? Have you had time to, to look at that at all, or uh, do you plan to do that later on? Yes, I'm going to do. There's been so much done there. They've kind of defined this whole study, I think, haven't they? They There's the, so many the, sites there. It's just incredible. Yeah. Yeah, the, the Alfred Watkins, the first guy there to define what a ley line was, basically looking at the Neolithic sites. And and there, there's even a few Brits out there, I think, that, that get a little peeved if, if we call anything else a ley line. So I apologize <laughs> to them, but it seems, sure it's okay. to be the best, right. it seems to be the best term that applies to these alignments. Right. So, so, But no, I was reading just the other day, there's a man that's doing very similar work to what I'm doing, in, but, but in Scotland. Okay. Mm -hmm. And he, he has a website called Mythomorphs. Okay, Mythomorphs. And, and he's got a lot of interesting things to say. And it, it's funny because they have islands there in Scotland that have these, these vaguely pyramidal structures on it that are valued in, in heraldry and Scottish lore. Yes. And, and um, I forget what Mr. Fayed's first name is, but the famous man who owns Harrods in London just bought one of these islands. Uh, that I had vectored the north uh, east facet of the pyramid that angle out and it seemed to intersect with the ruins at Baalbek I mean I could even stretch that and say that it matches the facet of the hexagon in the ruins of Baalbek it seems to at about 45.55 degrees hmm. Uh, you know, you can move these things around a little bit and make it do what you want to do. I just noticed that it matched, and it matches the angle really, really close to the way that structure is built, too. Huh. And others have supposed that these two structures are, are, are related. Uh, Sitchin, for instance, he, he is, is a, a, a linguist that has done a lot of work that we all, you, know, you may have heard of him before. Sure, yeah. Uh, in Samaria, and he supposes that the pyramids in Baalbek and Mount Ararat form a line by which the Anuaki had a landing site, you know. So so he, he noticed this connection. Others like Graham Hancock and, and uh, Boval noted the 45-degree angle orientation of the pyramids themselves, and this all fits into this. Hmm. People, Other people are noticing this angular association, too, and really – it is a, a very close to being a perfect 45 degree angle and that just speaks to how well the pyramids are laid out right there it speaks to the mystery of how did the egyptians know they oriented their their structures towards the pole that's in the middle of the ocean how did they know this it's a basic mystery that people have supposed before yes so i, I started looking at this relationship and i and uh, thanks to everybody who's contacted me out there, and, and everybody's been really nice, and, and it's just been great to to be with you all on Red Ice. Wonderful. Thanks, uh, Court. I'm uh, really looking forward to diving into some of this new material here today with you. Um, maybe we can do a quick little recap, though, of some of the things that we talked about. Uh, one thing that I was interested in, again, in kind of, uh, I guess, clearing out an issue is in regards to how you how you draw up the lines, how you make uh, uh, a connection, so to speak, let's say between two cities or something like that. Uh, we talked last time about that you're primarily using Google Earth and so forth. Uh, do you do like a page dump and draw lines with it, or do you use some kind of tool in order to link up uh, one city to another one, or how do you how do you approach this? Yeah, you can use the measuring tool that's included there with Google Earth that gives you a distance and bearing. Um, of anything. They're, they have another tool that's a line tool that you can do that will just give you a distance along any angle you want to go. So the, the, the bearing tool and um, distance tool gives you the, the, the shortest distance in bearing or any angle that you want to measure with it too. So you, if you're using like a, an element of a monument that may point somewhere, you kind of figure out what which bearing it's pointing to. And this is all with, with the latitude and longitude grid as north. And, um, and do you also... Then, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go, well, then I just pull the line out and see what's along it. 
And then and you, you, you just survey it using Google Earth, zooming in on things, using the, the information that they have available and all the, the – I noticed that the distance between the two also was about 407 miles by my measurement on Google Earth. Hmm. And, and this scene – go do you, ahead. Do you think that uh, Baalbek is the first – site where everything stems from or do you think that the 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 pyramids in uh, in egypt is the origin of this what do you think well i think the pyramids were there first is the what most people believe and that's kind of where i'm proceeding from but it's possible that the the things you read about baalbek too also do suggest that there could have been several temples there prior to the remains that are there now that may or may not have involved the, the large trilithon stones that are there that are a mystery also how those were moved there because mm. those are um, could be the largest cut stones in the world the largest man-made stones ever made and uh, so th- I mean I'm not claiming to notice this relationship of the two places I just noticed it from pulling the lines on Google Earth it's very interesting though <laughs> You know? So, yeah, the association just seems such a coincidence. When I first found it, I was just like, there's no way. Yeah. You know, I couldn't I couldn't believe it. And, and everybody there at home, too, if you're listening, go to Google Earth and give this a try. Just just put the line tool there on the, the southwest corner of the Great Pyramid. And uh, even if the image they have up there doesn't show you where the pyramid would be from plan view, just connect the two corners and you can usually get a pretty fair you know, angle from that, or just go that 45.55, and, and if you pull it to Lebanon, to Baalbek, you'll see that the cities and geographic information they include. So, and do, the, do, uh, do that, when you do that, does that include like the curvature of the earth as well, or is this like if you would have laid the map out flat and, and draw a line between it? Do you know how that works? Yes, yes, I do, and the tool that actually does that for you, Oh. That you're pulling. It's it's like giving you a compass bearing from the point you're measuring from. I see, I see. And um, yeah. last time, of course, we were primarily focusing in on uh, Thomas Jefferson's uh, uh, line, so to speak, his township grid and so forth. But since then, you've, you've pretty much uh, gone into this whole other area in regards to uh, the potential roots of this, I guess. Uh, we, I guess we can begin to talk a little bit about where you think this stems from to begin with, you you discover something in regards to the Egyptians so that they developed latitude and longitude. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Now, this is my theory. I'm just supposing this. No one else is, you know, I think other people have kind of suggested that they thought this must exist because the pyramids are oriented to true north. And... Um, let me speak again to the to the measuring tool in Google Earth because that's going to come into the story here too. The the angles that that's given you are measured with regard to latitude and longitude, so grid north and true north are very close. So so you know they're pretty much inter- interchangeable for our purposes here, just to generally describe ley lines and things like that. But what I noticed was with the, with the, what started me thinking that the Egyptians may have had a form of latitude and longitude is the fact if you match it to the facet of the hexagon, it'll match it hmm. at, at within 45 degree to 46 degrees. Do, do, you, um, do you think that this could be made by uh, surveying on from the Earth or on the Earth, or, or does this imply that you have they ha- had to have some kind of... Uh, uh, aerial perspective in order to get this or can, do you think you can do it from from earth by measuring correctly yes it could be done from earth it, i think we'd all would love to you know think that that the sumerians came in with the spacecraft and did it and everything like that but it is entirely possible to have they, they could have gone over land and, and surveyed that way if they had skills at that i mean there's no evidence that they even had a compass but but the fact that they're orienting their buildings the way they did suggests that they did hmm. so they could have, have surveyed over land 90 degrees to a point where they were 90 degrees south of Baalbek and then surveyed their way, way to there but 
it's incredibly accurate the the angle matches the 45 degree angle and the it's about 407 miles so so when i examine this spatial relationship i just started thinking in terms of a hypotenuse and what is that for people that don't know and that is the diagonal measurement of a, a square or a rectangle mm. from, from which you know you obviously you, that's a model for the square or rectangle itself you can draw a square or rectangle just from a diagonal line by just you know connecting the square angles around the the ends of the line mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I started looking at that, and I realized that it seemed to match a 